When I was able to flip that switch in my brain, that psychic shift in my brain, to really operate from a place of what am I bringing was the key to being in the now. Yogis, yoginis, welcome back to Dharma Talk episode number 12. This week's guest is Jeannie Heaton. And some weeks, the interviews on here are lighthearted, we're laughing, we're having a good time. Sometimes they're a little bit more serious, a little bit more emotional. That's the case this week. Jeannie Heaton is a recovering heroin addict, and she holds no punches in telling her own story and how it led her to play the role that she's playing now, which is to bring yoga to the population of recovering addicts in Athens, Georgia, and also beyond. Jeannie shed some light on some striking parallels between the 12-step recovery program and the practice of yoga. But she also points out that the traditional recovery process is missing a critical link and yoga steps in to fill that piece. We talk about why addiction is not a problem of the, of the brain, despite what a lot of people think, and what addiction is truly a symptom of. We talk about why the one person you can't stand or the person you think you're most different from can end up being your best, most important teacher and finally, we talk about a simple psychic shift that Jeannie has made and continues to practice every single day that has been responsible for unlocking the present moment. So stick around right through these announcements for the interview. Yogis, I've got a whole lineup of special events coming your way this summer that I'm excited to share with you. And I'm going to rattle them off in order of most serious to most lighthearted and fun. Okay, first of all, I'm assisting Jared McCann in his 300-hour quote-unquote advanced teacher training at Lighthouse Yoga School in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, this July. Now, it's advanced in the sense that we will be working on sequences that include advanced asanas, but really, the more advanced part about it is the intensity of the spiritual practice or sadhana every single day is going to start with seated meditation in a group and you'll take away a practice that you can carry forward for the rest of your life. Uh, I did this training myself last year and this year I'm helping out with it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Next, if you're not really interested in becoming a yoga teacher, you can still do the teacher training, but we also have another option for you, which is a 30-hour intensive over the Labor Day weekend. Uh, this one is four days of intense practice with posture clinics, um, yoga philosophy training, and lots of meditation as well. This is a great option if you don't want to make the time or financial investment of a teacher training, but you really want to deepen your practice. And then the last thing I want to share with you is also in July, in between the two modules of the teacher training, I'm going to be in Chicago for the We Are Yoga Vacation. It's taking place at 105F, Chicago's original hot yoga studio. But they're going to be yoga classes of all different styles, different teachers teaching all the different classes. And we're going to take excursions too, so it'll be fun. We've got Pitchfork Music Festival going on, Chicago Cubs games, if that appeals to you. So here's the deal. I've got a special 10% discount for you, my Dharma Talk listeners, my followers, for any or all of these three events. You can apply that 10% to your tuition for teacher training or the immersion or a four-day pass at 105F for the Chicago vacation. So to get that discount code and register for the events, head on over to henrywins.com slash events. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your dharma. Hello, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back for another episode. Today, my guest is Jeannie Heaton. 
Jeannie's journey began with a deep realization that if she were to save her life, she would need to change it entirely. After years of debilitating heroin addiction and homelessness, a painful attempt at rehabilitation, and eventually surrender, she discovered hot yoga and realized this was the missing ingredient to her recovery and that it could be the missing ingredient to everyone's recovery. She received a scholarship to Bikram Yoga teacher training in 2010 and went on to co-found the nonprofit One Posture at a Time with pureaction.org in Texas and Fuel Hot Yoga in Georgia. Welcome to the show, Jeannie. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Henry. It's so great to be here. Awesome. Well, I always start these interviews with the exact same question, and today will be no different. Jeannie, what does the word dharma mean to you, and what is your dharma as you understand it today? Well, you know, it's so it's such a great question because, um, first of all, when I began yoga way back, I didn't even know what the word dharma meant. I knew what the word karma meant, but um, I didn't know what the word dharma meant. And, um, and when I found out what it meant and so many other things with yoga, I was realizing how, because I found yoga when I was sober, clean and sober, about a year and a half in. And I realized that so much of it translates back to recovery program, 12-step program, and everything that I was already doing in a mental for my brain. And um, so the, 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 the definition, being that there's a lot of them that I've learned now, um, for me with Dharma is that it's a right way of living or a path of rightness. Um, which has to, for me, be unchanging so that I live in compliance with the world. Um, so the big thing for the drug addict and the alcoholic or any addict of anything is um, resistance and rebellion. We have a saying, rebellion dogs at every step. So that to completely be humbled by um, losing everything, which I did uh, due to shooting heroin um, for years, losing everything, I had to either surrender or die. And so a huge part of now uh, moving toward God and to stay on a right path of living is, is to humble and stop resisting and stop resisting every single thing. And as I understand my Dharma today, Um, is to try to bring that message, to share that message to um, all addicts, alcoholics, anybody suffering with any kind of addiction anywhere that, um, you know, that yoga is to bring yoga to all communities everywhere. And that yoga is the missing, like you just read in the bio in the beginning, yoga is the missing ingredient to recovery, no doubt about it. And in my experience. So how would you say that, um, that yoga helps to reconcile that balance between rebellion resistance on the one hand and surrender on the other? Well, for me, (laughs) uh, in the postures. So, and, and we're talking about Hatha yoga right now. So, you know, the asana practice for me, um, Uh, So that if you are, you know, being told to uh, stand on one leg and try to contract your thigh and pick up your foot and interlock your fingers. So there's these precise directions for the for my adult addicted brain that um, was able to latch into that. It was so clear and so specific that whether I could do it or not, um, I was able to begin to just listen and try to try to do the action. And at first when, you know, and I'm also talking about the Bikram practice was which I started with. Um, so when you're being told a command, which is in yoga, we are directed and told to do things. Um, I, in a good class, really, I would say. And yeah, in good class. Uh, thank you. It really got my back up. 
it's like, who are you talking to? Why are you talking to me? Like what, you know, I don't need, I don't need to do all that. Like very resistant, very rebellion dogs at every step. Very, um, you know, and it felt very personal, felt mm. so personal. Like I am rocking my knee, you know, like <laughs> why are, you know, I felt so personal and, um, and it was, it was those kind of things that began to, as in, then I went back to class the next day or the next day I would realize, oh, he's talking to everybody. He's not just, to, you know, it's not about me. And so it was very humbling in, in that, oh, it's not about me. It's, it's a set of directions, like, you know, making a cake or whatever. And so that if I could just use the posture to humble that resistance in me. I mean, there were, there's times in the class where the posture brings up these feelings where, you know, you, the fight, flight, or freeze, you either want to fight your way through or throw my water bottle at the fucking teacher or, you know, um, run out of the room uh, or, or you just deer in the headlight, you know, so that I... I would experience that every class. And I thought this cannot be good for a person to be moving through this, which I've come to find out later, you know, the posture moving you through sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system in, in rates of speed that felt so fast. I couldn't, I couldn't hang on, you know, I just couldn't. And then I realized that that was resetting the way I react to the world. And so that if I could find a way to react safely and sanely and soberly to a posture and this person telling me to do things that then maybe in the world, you know, if, if something happens, something pops off something, especially in New York city, someone, you know, tells you something you don't want to hear or, or you're stuck in the subway, you're waiting for the train. I could maybe tap into that same uh, parasympathetic, sympathetic flow and just be like, okay, this too shall pass. I can breathe. I can hang on. I can stand here and contract my thigh and, you know, like mm -hmm. just trying to get mind body connection rather than everything being so in my brain that I think everybody's personally affront confronting or affronting or, you know, uh, victim consciousness. I thought everybody yeah. was out to get me. Yeah. I really like what you said about, um, at first really believing that it was directed personally at you and how you noticed after a certain amount of time with this practice that you were reacting defensively. And I, one thing that I've really come to take away from my yoga practice and, and I've spoken to others who agree with me on this is that yoga kind of teaches you that everyone is special, but no one is special in their specialness, right? So that's right. I in think fact, you I can take that lesson book. away with you everywhere. You know, it's, I it's not always about you. I want to write a book for kids that said, I want to write a book for kids that literally like a children's book that is says, you know, you're not that special. <laughs> you're not that unique. Yeah. You know, you have, yeah. Because our children wish, need to hear that. <laughs> man, you know, I'm different. I literally thought I was just telling my mom yesterday. I'm out in Arizona visiting my mother who just turned 85 and, you know, she, she's desperately trying to figure out this whole addiction thing and, and what has happened to me and, you know, and was it her fault? And it's so amazing. I'm like, mommy, it's, it's not your fault, you know? And, um, and, uh, you know, it just is, it's just what happened. And she says to me, you know, well, I just want to know like what it is that, you know, that I could have done better. And I, I was just trying to explain to her that it's, it's a, it, well, I'm off track now, but anyway, my, this whole trip visiting parents, realizing that, um, my journey with addiction really has nothing to do with family and everything to do with family, you right. know? And right. so that, uh, yeah. So anyway, you've spoken a little bit, off track, but. That's okay. You've spoken a little bit about how your um, your first reactions to the practice went through your mind and your body. But what does your personal yoga practice look like now? Are you are you still doing mainly the Bikram practice, and how has it evolved to support you and your Dharma? So the Bikram practice, I practice daily um, as as much as I can, or I practice a Vinyasa practice. Um, 
I my uh, school where I teach is Feel Hot Yoga and Jolin. Uh, we have Vinyasa with a Jared McCann, and um, I also am a Yin. I teach Yin, and um, and I teach in drug programs, and so we do, you know. Uh, but I always come back to the Bikram as like a reset. Mm-hmm. It just feels so good in my body. Um, but I also practice, you know, like out here, I'm practicing, it's 112 degrees on the patio. So it's like perfect. Um, (laughs) mind you, there's no humidity. So you sweat and the sweat just like evaporates immediately. Um, so my, I practice daily. I wake up in the morning, like what my yoga looks like is I wake up in the morning. I do some asanas. I do like right next to the bed. I drop to the floor I hit the floor. I say my prayers. Um, I have some uh, prayers and meditation that I say uh, for myself to God. I thank God for allowing me to be sober today. And um, at the end of the day, I always thank God for keeping me sober, if that was the case. And it's been the case for the last 12 and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I say my prayers, my step three prayer, my step seven prayer, which are very much like a mantra, which I say over and over. Um, yeah, I've noticed you bring up sort of the uh, similarities or parallels between the addiction programs that you um, involved yourself with before you came across yoga and your yoga practice now. Um, So I'm interested to hear a little bit about your experience teaching in these programs now, bringing the yoga into that context that you came from. What has that been like? Well, you know, for me, my addiction took me to such depths of um, degradation and uh, terror and I don't, I just horror at the bottom of the bottom where, um, you know, I, I shot drugs in a way I couldn't really find any veins. Um, and the way I ended up shooting drugs created a lot of abscesses on my body. And so there's a tremendous amount of scar tissue and healing, which is another reason why when I took that first yoga class, um, which I talk about in the New York Times article, um, where uh, this, the, the moving of the postures and then the heat, the heat at that certain temperature melting scar tissue, 105 degrees begins to melt scar tissue. And um, so doing those postures and being able to really, uh, it took me about a year and a half to take off my sleeves and reveal my arms in class in the mirror. And uh, so that whole journey took me a long time to really, through the yoga and AA, find the confidence um, through uh, 12-step programs to... um, bring it into the programs and so because I had to become willing to share my story and be willing to bear my soul and my heart and what the yoga has done for me so that means showing you know the the bottom in fact one of my first classes when my friend took me to yoga she said I said well you know I have really bad body issues I can't do can't go to hot yoga I can't do that thing and she turned to me and she said who doesn't You know, Mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter. You know, the scars may be on the outside. So I try when I go to programs to bring that that very beginning little whisper that I had laying in that first class. It was like this could, in fact, save me in in the physical way, because so many people in programs are when they give up the drugs and the booze and they're, they start presenting because the, the drugs and the booze depress the body. They hold the body kind of down, com- depressing any illness. So when the body, now you've taken the drugs and the booze away, now you start presenting with all kinds of things from, you know, heart disease, blood pressure, problem, high blood pressure, diabetes it's so crazy people put down the booze and the diabetes and and all these things the body just starts going crazy which Mm -hmm. also happened to me you know i had like blood i had to be on blood pressure medicine i had to be on all kinds of psych meds because i was situation they told me i was depressed and i was like listen you live my life you'd be depressed too but i had to go on the medication um and so over time you know you start to 
those things start to fade away and I was able to in treatment get off everything but I try to bring that message into the facilities so as I'm teaching class and a lot of times it's a yin class what I teach at fuel now is not it's a 60 minute hot fuel class um which is just one set of postures each uh, the Bikram series. but I try to yeah and I yeah. try to communicate um you know, what's going on with them in their body uh, so that they're not scared and that the only way to get out of this pain is to go right through the middle of it. Mm -hmm. You know, with addiction, the problem is not the brain. I mean, it's a brain disease, blah, 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 everything else. But there's all these new studies showing, and I so identify with this, that addiction is not a substance problem. It's a connection problem. We don't know how to connect with people. We are disconnected. And in our culture right now, we think we're all connected on the phones and the thing and the, you know, but it's a two dimensional world. We're not looking in someone's eyes. We're not sharing this practice in a room with other people. We're not struggling side by side. We're not helping people choose to see that they can struggle, right, like in a safe way, or they can choose to suffer. And if they choose to suffer through, right, and in the beginning, it's a lot of suffering, um, that then you start to realize that this is the only way out, is right through the middle of it, is right through it. Um, and well, the I other question that I think is really missing in, um, in addiction in, in these places is not what's wrong with you. Why are you addicted? What's the problem with you? What's the, you know, or people who can't be still in class, what's the matter with you? Be still. You know, I hate all that kind of, it's more like, why doesn't someone ask, what happened to you, honey? What happened? What happened in your life where you're unable to be still? You know, and that was huge for me. I had the first teacher, Raphael Pachitti, who was like, honey, what happened to you? And I lost it. You know, it's just like, you know, you never know what's going on with a human. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so yoga is a place where I try to bring that energy to the facilities where people can talk to me and, and I can say what happened, you know? Um, well, I think so. I can tell why you feel so compelled to do the work that you're doing. Uh, I really, you know, appreciate what you said about being connected to one another. I think there's so much power in that. And that's why, you know, home practice is great, but it's so different it's a different experience to get into a studio and be practicing or whether it's a studio or not you know that doesn't really matter but being practicing with a group of people and you know having that shared experience whether it's just your yoga practice that can be powerful but something deeper than that like a shared trauma that you can relate to just gives mm -hmm. people a sense of security and you know what you said about coming out of an addiction, sort of having to take two steps back before you can go forward. If you didn't have someone there to guide you on the way out, you might be discouraged by that and just give up entirely. So I, I love all of that and really yeah. appreciate you sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and it was also like, I felt like because the Bikram dialogue was so commanding, um, there's, there's not a lot of room, um, for you know especially the way i was brought in um with with teachers who like they were commanding but at the same time very very loving and mm -hmm. so you wanted just enough fear to go in the room you know and i'm a i'm a you know people pleaser is just another word for a big friggin liar um you're just a liar if you're a people pleaser and mm -hmm. so i would go in the room and just lie you know like because I wanted the love from the teacher, you know, I mean, I still work on that. That's one of my huge defects of character um, is that I'm working through like, OK, um, you know, just fall back, do less, listen to your body. That's where I am now. But in the beginning, I needed that. Like, you know, something I, to hold I you accountable to. Yeah, I needed accountability on my mat. Yeah. And I needed people to be like a little bit. And the people that I didn't like. You know, my teacher was like, you are only allowed to take their class then. You cannot uh -huh. take, and I don't want to see you taking anybody else's class. You're going to take the one person. And those people, those teachers, 
ended up becoming my favorite teachers, like, and my friends. And probably the ones that you learn the most from, because you have to learn to deal with that. So whatever it is that's coming up. Exactly. Because it's the one person in your life that is, you think is the most different from you, right? That's the one you have to reach out to and say, hey, come get a coffee with me. The one person you can't stand, the one person that's, because you know, that thing, 99.9% of our DNA is the same as everyone else. So, whoa, so where we judge and criticize and try to see the differences in people through skin color, hair, uh, religion, sex, jobs, money, prestige, power, poverty, all of these things, addiction, where we stigmatize people like, whoa, what does that say about ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, and so my other biggest thing with this practice is to destigmatize addiction because if it was a choice people think that people choose to you know uh become addicts uh there is definitely choice in putting it down but the way the dna the way trauma presents in the body the way substances come in and make you feel whole at first is medicating a very deep pain. Yeah. And so the trauma in the body, it's held cellularly. You know, it's held genetically. It's in the DNA. And so when the first trauma happened, right, that very first traumatic event, the way you reacted, the way you, I mean, think about how if you see a cute girl or a cute boy, you blush. The whole body, the whole body, body blushes the whole so think about if you were beat as a kid or you were abused or you were molested the whole body relax reacts the body holds that so how you know so when the brain changes so it is a brain disease in that the way now we react to everything is from a memory of that trauma now what are we going to do can't sit around and try to shrink yourself 12 steps are awesome believe me i go three four times a week as much as i can i have sponsees i have a sponsor i work a program um but i'm going to tell you that sitting around in a room talking about yourself in a way that is re-injuring right the body closes the body tightens down, damps down, you know, rather than the yoga, a back bend, open your chest, open. the mm-hmm. feelings come up, you lift your chest, everything shoots out of you. You don't have to talk about it. You don't have to process it. You don't have to, you know, medicate it. Um, it's you that mind body connection. You work yeah. through the body and you then work through the energy to get to the mind. And right now I'm really struggling with the Bikram practice because that stillness is that stillness in between. It's like, oh, my God, I don't know. You know, I just am having that's my hardest thing is being still in the yoga room because the posture comes up. The stuff starts flying through the body, molecularly, cellularly, blood, oxygen, glucose. And I just like I literally my hands will shake my just like breathe breathe, go back to the breath, you know, breathe deep in the breath. And honestly, I don't think, oh, I'm going to cry here a minute. I don't think I ever took a full breath until I found yoga. I don't think I ever breathed. I don't, I still don't know how to breathe in a yoga room. And I've been practicing yoga 11 years. Um, I, it's, it, it's stillness and breath. The first two things you're taught is, are the two hardest things for me and it's because you know i don't know what's gonna come out i don't know what is gonna happen um so it's a lot of fear so you know safety is a huge i try to one of the biggest things for when i work in drug programs is creating an environment of safety so no one can come in the door is shut no one can want you know a lot of counselors like oh this is over we gotta go no stay out you know Mm -hmm. because you don't know what's going on in there you know um 
Yeah, you've created anyway, this space where people yeah. are totally exposed and vulnerable. At least that's what you're encouraging them to try to open themselves mm-hmm. up to. Mm-hmm. And then to have, you know, a harsh break in that would just destroy all the trust and, and the good work that, sh- that you've yeah. been creating. I mean, you know, when you do a chakra guided meditation or you do, you know, you got to seal yourself back up or teaching, you know, giving this back, this work back, you know, in order to keep it, you got to give it away. So, you know, it's all wonderful to have your practice, but, you know, for me, if you're not giving it back, you're not going to be able to keep your own practice. Um, So, and vice versa, you know, you can't give it away if you're not keeping it, you know, practicing it. Um, Well, I I love everything that you're, you're doing with one posture at a time. And I think it's been very successful, you know, to to bring your teaching, your experience, and all the other teachers that are involved to these communities. But I'm also sure that it hasn't all been, you know, a positive upward trajectory. So I'd love to hear a story from you about maybe a wall that you hit, either creating that program or putting it into effect, and then what you did to to get through it. Oh yeah, um, in the in the very beginning, I was teaching in a young mother's program up in the Bronx. So I started this in New York um, with a guy, Frank King and Stacy Gerald, that were like my two first people. Um, I started in the Bronx and we took this program into a young mother's program. And the young mother's program was where women have, if they're addicted, um, they have their babies and, uh, it, you know, they wean them. The, the babies now have to go through detox And they bring the mother and the baby to this program, which is like a brownstone. Um, And the babies are upstairs detoxing while the women are trying to get sober. So it's an incredible place of tremendous loss and uh, and tremendous healing all at the same time. And uh, we were we brought our mats and I would roll my wheelie cart with my mats around (laughs) to uh, to the women, took the mats up there. And we had this little space that's so valuable in New York City, very little of it. So we would be in their dining room and lay out the mats on the sticky dining room floor. It's crazy. Actually, I'll I'll send you a pic to that. Um, Anyway, um, so I had this one girl. Well, I had many of them that didn't want to do it. They didn't want to do it. There's like, how the fuck is this yoga going to help me? Like, you, you, I got a baby upstairs addicted to meth or methadone. I got me trying to come off and you're going to tell me that I'm going to stand on one leg. How is that going to help me? And I said, I don't know how I just know it works. So we're doing the class, right? And it's like, all you have to do is just try. I don't care. Just stand on your mat. You can even sit in the back. Just listen. Even if you close your eyes, try to do the words, right? So this one girl comes in and she's giving me the, evil eye like evil eye big girl and um i'm thinking wow this girl i think she's gonna punch me i think like this is like whoa she's sitting in the back and i thought okay this is your chance to you know walk the walk you're gonna go over there and extend your hand to her are you going to you know turn around and walk out of the room and go you know fuck them they don't want yoga you know which is sometimes you know how i get (laughs) in my brain um because it's hard, you know, it's hard. So especially if you haven't moved your body ever, which was my story. So I go, I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm going to go over there. I sit down next to her. I extend my hand and I say, hey, what's going on? What's happening? And uh, she turned to me and she said, Miss Jeannie. And I was like, whoa, Miss Jeannie. <laughs> she said, I just want to tell you, and this is New York, I just want to tell you that I would like to participate, but I have pain. And she was rubbing her leg, and I said, pain? Where's the pain? What's going on? She said, no, and I, because I didn't understand what she was saying. She said, no, I have pants. I, I can't, I have no pants. She was pointing to her pants. She said, these are the only pants I have, and I don't want to rip them. I started crying. I was like, okay, I'll bring you pants next week. No, So you never know what's going on with a person. And so I really, again, you know, you hit these walls where people 
don't want to do it. Um, so much in treatment. They don't think they can. They don't think they can get down on the floor. They don't think they can get back up. Like we're talking really basic stuff, you know, therapeutic yeah. stuff. Um, and so the next week I brought the pants. Everybody got pants. I went to the Conway. Everybody had pants. It was like Christmas. We all had so much fun. So it's like, you know, had I just turned and walked out, Henry, you know, same thing. I had one in um, the program I was in. Um, I was in this program way out in Jamaica, Queens for 19 months, detoxing methadone very slowly. And I thought, you know, to walk back into that facility, that facility with a yoga mat under my arm um, and, and rather than coming back into that facility because of a relapse, right, having to do it again, which there are many, re, we call them re-threads, retreads. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do, I'm not a retread. Com coming in there as a yoga teacher, setting up the mats, very, very resistant. They do not want to do the yoga. Yeah. And one guy, he's like, listen, I'm on 10 milligrams. I'm not doing this class. Like, I'm not, I'm going out backyard and I'm smoking. I'm not doing this class. And I was like, you know what? Why don't you just lay on the mat? You don't have to do anything. Just lay on the mat. Big guy, fit guy, weight guy. You know, they have a weight room there. Um, and I'm like, you know what? You know, just rest here. Because he hadn't slept in what he said was two months, which I believe him. I don't think I slept four months in there detoxing at least. And I said, because the body's so awake without the opiate, right? And the body wants to be awake. It's not depressed anymore. So I said, just lay here on the mat and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the class and you just stay there. So, of course, you know, we have a saying, you hang around a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. You hang <laughs> around a yoga room long enough, you're going to do a yoga pose, right? Yeah. So, of course, he doesn't want to just lay there. He wants to get up and try. Of course. So he gets up, starts doing the breathing starts to you know we start doing half moon and he's doing the class comes to the end of the class we're all laying down and we're doing i'm doing a long guided meditation savasana um like a yoga nidra thing and uh we hear snoring from the corner the guy is out like a light snoring and stacy and i literally tears rolling down our face like this is the yoga. This is the give back. This is, you can't pay a person enough money. There's, there's, you know, if I was to try to put a price on that kind of feeling in my soul, which is healing me probably more than it's healing them. Um, you know, it's truly incredible. Yeah. Um, that's such service, a, an amazing story. Yeah. And, you know, what Crazy, I took right? away from, from both that story and, and the one with the, the pants is kind of it harkens back to what you mentioned earlier. You really, as a teacher, like your first commandment, the first thing you have to do is be willing to pay attention to what your students are bringing into the room because you never know what yeah. their objection might be. It could be something yeah. totally simple that seems like a non-issue to us mm -hmm. when you look at the grand scheme of it. Like, oh, I can bring you a pair of yoga pants. Like, that should be the least of right. your concerns. Or right. it might be something totally debilitating, you know, like not being able to sleep for four months. Mm -hmm. But as long as you I know and you're willing to listen, that's what gives you the ability to, to heal. I had a guy just two weeks ago in our, so we have this new amazing class at Fuel Hot Yoga, um, 8 p.m. community class, free for addicts, you know, $10 suggested donation just so we can pay for the class and keep the class self-supporting, pay for the teacher, pay for the mats and the towel, you know, the laundry. Yeah, um, cover expenses. Had a guy, cover expenses, had a guy come in, literally looked like he had just walked off the street, hadn't had a bath, had, I mean, we're talking like, and I'm like, put my arms around him. I said, come on in, let's go. Put the mat out. And he's like, he's, I'm like, oh, you can't practice in jeans. And he's like, oh, I'm fine in jeans. And he's really fighting me. Mm -hmm. And I went downstairs because I have clothes for the guys, you know, bring up a pair of pants, shorts. And he's like, I'm like, how about these? These are these. And they're like, sir, short, you know, board shorts long. Like, okay. And he picks the one that had these cool, like, you know, um, kind of army shorts. And he picks those and puts them on. He's like, and then I'm like, and you can keep them. 
He's like, all right. I was like, if you wear them, you can keep them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the little things. It's, the, you know, um, I have these guys coming back, which is even bigger. You know, they come one class and I've got these huge weightlifting guys. You know, it's interesting. Weightlifting and yoga are the two things that really work for um, um, mental in- instability with addiction and compulsion uh-huh. um, because of the resistance training. So you're resisting because it's resistance training, the resistance kills the resistance in the soul. It's like the venom, you know, you take a little bit of the venom, kills the poison. So it's incredible why weights and why yoga, uh, hatha yoga, really, really helps with the addictive brain. I can see that. I mean, I think they both also share this um this sort of self-directed discipline where you watch your own progress. And, you know, there's a teacher or there's a trainer for weight training, but really you have to, um, only you can really follow your own progress over the long term. So I could, I could definitely see the similarity there. Yeah. Incredible, really. Um, uh, I think that the thing again, with the, the, the hardest thing, um, for the addict to do is change right and there's another saying we have change or die change or you'll be back out on the street begging for it um and so in practicing opposite actions which is okay i'm gonna go do this resistance strength training which is everything i can't do because i'm not strong i'm detoxing i feel like crap i've got diabetes i've got high blood pressure they've told me you know that i'm i have arthritis they tell me i can't you know, I can't balance. I have no flexibility. I'm not strong. You know, one thing, the one reason why people really have to get their fix is because they literally can't stand up, walk down the street. Um, uh, so in practicing opposite actions, um, this goes to every part of life. So it's like you ask yourself, for me, I ask myself, and it, it really is what we call the St. Francis prayer or the 11th step prayer, um, which is, you know, and I'm not preaching a God program. My God is very different from a Christian program, but it's all the same. You know, <clears throat> Bill W., who founded Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, he stole from the best. He, we don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to principles and morals, right, and responsibility. So um, – The whole idea with the St. Francis prayer that I try to practice daily is that, you know, where there's hatred, let me bring love, injury, pardon. So it's the opposite, doubt, faith, despair, hope, darkness, light, sadness, joy. So that with each and so and try to console and to be consoled, try to understand and to be understood and try to love rather than be loved. So, so much of our culture right now is coming from a place of what am I getting? What's Mm -hmm. in it for me? How am I going to get to, you know, rather than what am I bringing? And when I was able to flip that switch in my brain, that psychic shift in my brain to really operate from a place of what am I bringing was the key to being in the now was the key to being present. What am I bringing to the pose? What am I bringing to the teacher? What am I bringing to my class? What am I bringing to the desk when I work the desk? Am I watching how the students walk in the room? Are they limping? Do they have a little funny thing? What's that little thing in their neck, right? What am I bringing rather than why'd she tell me that at the desk? She should you know, know how much water is or what, right? No. Something's going on with her, right? She knows how much water is. Whatever, just say. Yeah. Okay. What am what, I bringing? What can I give instead yeah. of what can I take? And I, I think that's the perfect exactly. seg- segue to ask you this question, because you got because I do really appreciate you lending your time to the podcast today. Apart from getting your message out oh, on the so podcast, grateful. what are you doing to live your dharma today? Well, you mean this day right now? This day, right today, yeah. Oh, it's tough because I'm in off with family. 
and I'm with my mom. That's the hardest and, time uh, to do it, isn't it? Well, they always say, go hang out with your family. They'll show you how spiritually fit you are. <laughs> um, you know, people that come into your life will always give you an opportunity to see where your yoga is, where your practice is. You know, they'll always give you that opportunity to see how did you react? How did you respond? Did you breathe? Did you, you know, are you woke? Right? I love this new word, woke. I mean, it's not a new word, but <laughs> are you woke? Woke. I'm woke. Um, but, you know, I feel like that's really huge. And, and uh, for my mom right now, it's all about <sighs> going through. She just turned 85. And we're going through the papers. And what do I do when she dies? And what do I do with this? And what does this mean? And we went through all the pictures. And we're do, going through what this little vase means to her. And who was this, you know, person in her life. And all of her, when she went to nursing school. And all the past. And, you know, and looking at you know, what do you do when the, you know, just like big girl panty stuff, you know, like got to put your big girl panties on and, uh, and, 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 uh, just be able to sit and listen and be of service to my mom right now, which is, um, which is tough because, you know, there's that whole long history. Um, and I came with questions that I got to ask her, um, and so I have a few more that I'm leaving tomorrow. So I have a few more on the list that I need to ask today. So that'll be, you know, I'll just see where I can, you know, and I think it's amazing too. in being able to bring that, the questions gives her a chance to share. Yeah. Um, with it's the me. perfect so, opportunity to do everything you were just talking about, yeah. focusing on, on being, you know, uh, uh, a servant rather than a taker. Yeah. I mean, you know, in 12 step, you, when you get through the steps and you go all the way, the, the, the triangle is, there's a symbol of the triangle and the, the, the top, like when you look at it, the top, there's no big eyes or little U's. No one gets to the top. No one completes. You're working to be a servant to the group you're working to serve and so that was another thing i thought oh my god i gotta get sober and be a saint like i can't do that i am the, i am the last person you knew the stuff i did henry that's no way like there's no way that mm -hmm. any god is going to forgive this like the you know hardcore addiction in new york city um so i when i found out no you we just you know there's no perfection these are just guides to spiritual practice you know so yeah. yeah and you just come back around to to help yeah okay Jeannie it's time for the prana round so uh -oh. okay. this is where I ask you six rapid-fire questions and ask you to answer in as little as one word maximum one sentence are you ready for the prana uh -huh. round I'm ready I'm ready okay. for the prana round mm -hmm. okay in one word why do you practice <laughs> yoga acceptance what's your favorite yoga pose and why this is a hard one because it really changes so if if we're asking for today is yeah. and and being that we bring it back to stillness and breath and I, I don't say this to be um silly but i say savasana right now um no, it's my good most challenging it's my it is for me to sit still and be okay with with change, Savasana. What's the yeah. single best cue or piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? So, I, you know, I listen to your podcast. So I'm not bullshitting you. I'm ready with these answers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like John, but I, it, and now after our talk, it changed a little bit. But this one, I, my, my single best cue. And my hardest was to look up, look in the mirror, look in the mirror. Ooh, yeah. Hardest, most challenging, eyes up, still hardest. Um, and my teachers always know when I'm faking it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, don't do that thing. Don't do that glaze over. You know how to 
pretend to look in the mirror, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I love that my teachers know. And I have to say, advice from a teacher is Jolyn right now. And one reason why I left New York and moved to Georgia is Jolyn is so incredibly amazing with her belief in me. Oh, I'm gonna cry. Belief in me until I can believe in me. So since I struggle with so much trauma to the body from, you know, I use the syringe in a way that's so um, almost like a cutter, you know, because of so much past trauma and self-harm, self-mutilation. She whispers in my ear, she'll just come by and go, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And every time she says it, I I fall apart because I honestly believe I can't. I honestly believe I will never get there. And she always reminds me, if you believe you can't, you can't. You believe you can, you can't. You can do it. And um, a she simple, still tells me that. Yeah. Simple but profound yeah. piece of advice there. You can do it. Okay, Jeannie, recommend Incredible. one book, modern or ancient, for our audience. Oh, just one? Just one. You have to choose. Well, I'm going to say The War of Art, um, which is it's a it's a little paperback by Stephen Pressfield. You can read little quotes a day. I'm working on writing a book about this whole story, and it it, it kind of talks. You're working speaks, on writing a book. I am. Oh, and okay. It's, it speaks to writing or creative blocks, but it's about breaking through the blocks to win your inner creative battles. So it pairs so beautifully with yoga. In that, um, you know, with yoga, what we're doing is breaking through blocks and barriers from the mind to the body. So one of the big things with addiction is that we've lost the connection. So, you know, when you fire that thought to contract the thigh over and over, you're sending that message from the brain to the thigh to lock it and you can't give up. So the war of art is all about firing, fire, you know, firing the brain through your resistance to never give. And that everything in life is about resistance. Every single thing is about resistance, which is crazy when you think of it, because underneath the resistance is the fear. And then everybody's like, no, everything's about fear. No, everything's about resentment. No, everything's about harms or everything's about, it's actually the, I feel like the first one is resistance. So that's why I practice yoga for acceptance because I can't, I got to stop resistant, resisting. So that would be my book. Although I have two more, but I won't say. (laughs) <laughs> we'll have to have you on again to get those yes. <laughs> when you're ready to talk about your book. Okay. There you it, go. Is yoga for everyone? Oh, absolutely. And okay. then some. And it's for everyone who thinks it's not for them, especially. The last question, how can our audience get in touch with you and what can we do to support you in your dharma? Um, so to support me in my dharma is to just reach out to one another. Um, to the people in your community, there will be 175 people today that will die from addiction, that will overdose today. Um, reach out to the person in your community, and if you don't know how, get get curious. Find out how to help save this epidemic that is murdering, murdering our country, opiate addiction. Um, let go of your stigma. Let go of your judgment see where you're the same, stop criticizing because all it is is a reflection of how much you're judging and criticizing yourself. So begin to find yourself love and reach out and, and help others. Um, what was the Thank other one? How do you get in touch with me? Yeah, how can we get in touch I with you? I have an Instagram account called um, One Posture. I have um, at One Posture, I have a Facebook page uh, uh, one posture at a time and um, and also through Pure Action they've been a huge part of so you can get me through them uh, pureaction.org Jeff and Marty Chen um, or you can also reach me I just put up a new website it's it's not in good shape yet it's coming along Henry um, <laughs> but I have a website one posture at a time dot org okay. so uh Great. And also um, the events, um, Friday nights, 8 p.m., uh, come to Feel Hot Yoga in Georgia. If you're having a problem with addiction or you're passing through or you are you don't even think maybe you have a family member struggling or maybe, you know, and just come and, you know, be in the room. Especially my, my students who are 
good practitioners. I need front row people. Come and show up and give back. <laughs> Come be in the room. Come be in the room. Yes. Okay, great. I'll link up to all those resources, all those websites uh, in the show notes so you can check those out there. Jeannie, thank you so much for coming on and bearing it all. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone's going to love this episode. So thank you again. Oh, thank you so much, Henry. It's my, it's, it's, you know, it, um, if life was fair, I should be dead. And so that's another thing I'll just let your listeners take away that, you know, a lot of times we feel that life isn't fair, so get out of that victim consciousness and just remember if life was really fair, ask yourself that question. And thank you so much, Henry. I love everything you're doing. You are a true inspiration for the yoga community, and we need your voice, so thank you. If you got something out of this episode, if you like Dharma Talk and want to keep it going, please do me a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. I know it's not the most convenient thing to do, but it makes all the difference in getting the show out there and more visible to other people who can benefit from it. And hey, if you've got feedback or ideas or you want to get in touch with me, you can do that on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep living your dharma.